Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, so my name is Glenn Hunter and I work with UK Sport. I'm part of the performance team at UK Sport. Just to give you a bit of background into UK Sport, um, our role fundamentally is to try and understand what it takes to win. Um, our focus is very much Olympic and Paralympic sport, that's our remit. And um, we're a non-commercial -com uh, organisation that was formed after the sort of what was perceived as the disgrace of coming 36th in the medal table in Atlanta, where the press said uh, we were beaten by Kazakhstan and put great shame on the nation for doing that. Um, and our job was to try and understand performance and understand what it takes to win and try and shift the nation from a sort of attitude of well done, never mind, to why didn't you win a medal? And so that journey was probably the most recently reflected in uh, what happened at London. So we get our money from the government and we get our money from the lottery and we are non-commercial and we invest that money in our sports and our athletes with the sole purpose of winning. That's kind of the mission really. So just a bit of insight into um, how we do that and what we try and achieve. I'm going to stand out of the way a bit. Um, so I'm part of a small team at UK Sport called the Innovation Team. I'm at the back and uh, our job is to, in this team, is to look at the concept of what we refer to as marginal gains. The sports we invest in own performance. They have to deliver the, metal, the medals, and we fund them on a basis of what's called no compromise. So if you don't deliver, you lose your money, basically. But once they get their money, we surround them with a team of, hopefully, excellence to try and help them on that mission to win medals. And in our team, we're a very small team, but we've got a cast of thousands that we bring in to try and find solutions to these little bits of things that add up to a medal. And in our world, that might be milliseconds, the difference between gold or oblivion, oblivion meaning nothing. So, um, so that's what our team tries to achieve. We have different roles in the team, and my focus is very much around understanding athlete health and risk. Clearly, you need athletes that are really healthy, that are performing at the extreme level, and you need to expose them to risk, because if you're not exposed to risk, you don't adapt to being the best in the world. But too much risk, and you can't perform, so you can't win a medal. So it's a bit of a, a tightrope walk, really. So um, as an example of what we do in terms of marginal gains in cycling, the riders, the coaches, the sport win the medals. In that photograph, however, are hundreds of little things. Why this is shaped the way it is, why the helmet's the way it is. All of these little things, when you put them together, make that little difference. In the work I did with rowing, as an example, four years' work for what equates to 0.9 of a second. It's nothing, really, except it's a medal, which is, which is quite good at the end of the day. So this project that we're talking about here today is part of this innovation idea around we feel that if we can better understand athlete health and risk, we will get a performance gain for British athletes. And that's our role in life, is Britain. That's what we're interested in. So, on the back of London, no nation has ever come out of the home Olympics and done better at the following Olympics. But we said that's what we're trying to do. So our minimum criteria for success in Rio is at least 66 Olympic medals and at least 121 Paralympic medals. That's never been achieved before. So it's quite a stretch to try and get there, but we're really focused on how we do it. And we have 1,400 athletes, roughly, in the UK. That's it. One of the things about our world is unlike rugby, uh, football, cricket, professional sports, where if someone gets injured or ill, you can buy someone else in. We can't. This is what we've got on that journey to Rio. So we have to understand that journey, understand what it takes to win, expose athletes to risk, to adapt, but don't go too far, because without that number of athletes, we get no medals at all. So we really got to understand this issue of health and risk. So that's our population heading towards Rio at the moment. We've got approximately 55 sports. I say approximately because if sports underperform, they may lose some of their funding. And the reason I put this diagram here of a council is that's what it feels like uh, when you go to a sport. It's like a fortress. It's going to let you in. It takes a while to get confidence and trust before you get to the workings of that sport. And the reason I'm showing you this, and this is critical to this kind of um, 
this presentation, is unlike, say, for example, you were doing this for rugby. Rugby at the highest level, at the smallest level, is a similar game. This is 55 different sports. <coughs> it's not a software solution that if you insert into rugby, you can go from top to bottom. What you might do here for archery is different than rowing. It's different for wrestling, etc., etc. So it's quite a unique challenge, actually. Why do we want to understand it? Well, in the three years up to London, if you count the number of days lost through injury and illness, it totals 22 years of time that were lost in the journey up to London. 17 years through injury and five years through illness, and five years of that was recurring injury. So what would you do, what would a sport say to you, do you think, if you could say to them, we'll give you some of those days back? If you have more days with your athletes because they're not injured or ill, you've got more chance of winning a medal. So that's why this concept is, uh, is absolutely critical. It's about how can we give sports days back to try and achieve this, this aim of, uh, of medal success and sustainability. So how do you try and understand it? Um, so over there you can see that word exposure. And what that means in terms of trying to understand it is that when athletes compete, they are exposed to risk. Everything we do in life has a risk associated to it. And you've got to understand the concept of what the athlete is exposed to, to really understand risk. So to, to try and make that really simple, let's imagine the two of us live in the same street and we cycle the same distance to work. Um, you cycle 400 days a year and I cycle 200. It's the same journey, it's the same route. But I'm exposed to half the risk because I'm doing 200 days compared to 400 days. And that's why exposure is really important. You have to know what risk athletes are exposed to. So how would you capture that and show a sport that element of exposure? And at the same time, once you've captured that, you've got to know about illness, what illnesses are the athletes uh, subjected to and sustaining, what injury are they sustaining. And then this concept at the bottom about restriction is a reality of elite sport in that most people are competing with some degree of pain. And they're restricted. They're not injured or ill and therefore not competing or training, they're actually battling on while they're in some element of discomfort. So understanding restriction is, is really important. It's not about injured or ill, it's about getting there while you've got some element of dysfunction. So we want to capture that intelligence, but the reality is that the mission of winning medals is really busy. There's a lot going on. The athletes and the sports need to get in there and adapt and train and focus. And to be the best in the world is massive commitment. So to come along in that world and say, oh, and by the way, we'd like you to fill in all this extra stuff about what you're doing. They're too busy for that. So in elements, what we've got to do is we've got to understand this without compromising the journey and the mission, which is a minimum of 66 medals, Olympic, 121 Paralympic in Rio and beyond. So what we're looking for is the final slide, a sort of a vision of success in my mind, is how can we come up with a really simple way of giving us an image around what's going on in the UK in our elite athletes to do with health and risk and performance. It really is fundamentally about behavioural change. It's not throwing loads of data out there. It's being able to look at it like a weather map and thinking, hang on a minute, something's changing up here. So let's talk to the sport about it. And then let's launch some special projects to help that sport get better at dealing with that. It's not masses and masses of data. It's the most subtle bits of information that makes that change. And I'll finish with a kind of concept to illustrate it. It's not a story I particularly like telling because it involves men's toilets in Scott Skiphol Airport. And you may be familiar with the story, I don't know. They had this classic challenge of men missing uh, fundamental principle, unfortunately, of being a man and creating all this mess, and no one could really solve it until someone had the idea of putting an image of a fly in the bowl, and suddenly men found something to aim for, and it reduced all of that horrible stuff that none of us want to think about. The principle being not the horribleness of the story, but a very simple thing that created a massive change in behaviour. So forget your idols. But take the concept and think, how could you come up with something that's similar to that principle, something really simple that has a massive change in behavior? Uh, that's kind of all I've got image-wise, I thought, to show the concept. <laughs>
Great. Okay. Well, let's let's open some questions. Then. Uh, Hello, you just um, mentioned that every sport is very different and are you expecting something that is applicable to all sports at the same time or, or uh, sport specific solutions or is it uh, totally open? Um, the, the way that we focus on it is not all sports. While all sports are equally important, the reality is that some are more likely to win medals than others. And so what we would do is we'd focus on the likelihood of medal success first of all and get it right there and then roll it out across the whole system. Roberta, there's a question. As I understand it, you're not looking to gather performance data because that's already been covered, etc. You're looking at ways to encourage the gathering of performance data and possibly gathering other data about things like how they feel to gather so you can get the mental state and the physical state of their illness or injuries or detect because you want to detect injuries before they happen that's the ideal situation I presume um, so I you're do. looking for patterns you're looking for patterns absolutely but the, the, the principle of this is saying that we should look at something say for argument's sake, we could put something on there now and say, right, what's the health of the nation in terms of elite sport? What does it look like now? Oh, and actually we've seen four more illnesses in rowing, for argument's sake. And then we'll call rowing and understand that a bit more. And rowing might say, you know, every time we get on an aeroplane and we fly, we always come back with illness. So we go, right, okay, what are we going to do about that? So then we launch a special project to try and find that solution. It's not going into massive diagnostics about looking at you know blood and all that kind of stuff. It's really saying something's going on over here, and let's. Cause a major philosophy of ours is that the sport owns performance. That's their job. What we do is we add value to that, but we need some intelligence to know that something is going on, something's changing. So every week we would expect a sport to say, right, we've got this many athletes, this many injuries, this many illnesses, and this many restricted athletes. And you know what? We're getting a real lot of back pain in the gym at the moment, so what can we do about that? So this system would allow us to see that pattern over the next four years, and we could imagine we could slide forwards and backwards in time, and then we see where the vulnerabilities are. Because it's all foreseeable, and therefore we have a duty of care, given the big investment, it's about 400 million investment approximately, of your and I money, to try and actually reduce what is foreseeable. Yeah, that's the concept. Um, when we, we were originally discussing this challenge as well, a number of other uh, kind of aspects came up, including things around um, maybe nutritionists and their, their also their ability to, to be able to input and to track, or maybe even it's the family of, of the athletes themselves. So there's a whole group around a single athlete, um, the doctors, the, the, the trainers, the, yeah, the nutritionists, and gathering data from them as well as from the athlete is, is part of this. Um, it could be part of it. Um, I see that will be uh, several phases down the line, actually. I think um, most nations and solutions to this issue have been really complex. Um, our sports drown in data, literally. And um, they capture everything because there's a great feeling of security around data. They often don't look at it. It's just there for like a security blanket. This is really around simple things that shift behavioural change. And if you switch it to another context, if you thought about the health of the nation and trying to get intelligence on um, certain illnesses or whatever it is, it's that kind of principle. The, 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 the sort of attitude that goes, science has established this, here's the message, go and do it, really fails to understand that in order for someone to do it, they've got to emotionally engage with that message. They've got to feel like they want to change. They've got to make a conscious effort to change their behaviours. This fundamentally is how do we change the behaviours of our athletes and our sports so they, that they're on the, you know, the front foot of tackling this issue of health and illness. It's not about drowning in loads of data. And I think the family, the doc and all that would be great, but, but you've got to, in my opinion, start with the most simple system and show that that can survive before you make it more complex. Personally. Um. Hi, so just want to confirm, is it 
the general sport, so for instance cycling across the nation, or is it just those 1,400 professional sports people that we've got going to the Olympics? It's 1,400 athletes. This is our role, is uh, whatever you want to term it, elite sport, high performance sport. But once those 400 people come into our radar, they become what we might what we refer to as podium potential athletes. Their, their, their mission is to win a medal from that group. That's our only focus. We, we are totally dependent on, on athletes coming through. And I think if we were to jump on a few years ahead, then clearly we'd look at that whole spectrum from identifying talent all the way through. At the moment, this population is elite sport, Rio. How can we impact on that? That's the focus, really. Hi, Glenn. You've been mainly talking about physical health, mental health too? Or? Oh, no, it's, all, it's all, all dimensions of that. Absolutely. Okay. It's a concept of, I'm just using headings of illness, injury and restriction. Um, one, one of the aspects why an athlete might be restricted is they're frightened. You know, they've, they've, um, they've injured themselves in that event before. They don't want to actually compete because they think the injury will happen again. This would bring that out. It's, it's flushing out all dimensions of what we understand by health and risk. And the, the, the threats in here as a project, like lots of things, is the issue of definition. What do you mean by illness? What is and isn't an illness? If someone's competing and they've got flu, is that ill, in, in, Ill or not? So there's a lot of issues around definition, and the mental side of it is all part of it. It's all in there. Yeah. Okay, we have no more questions.